jump right into your presence this morning. You never leave us or forsake us, but God, we want more of you, more of your spirit. Pour your spirit out over us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Reaching out, I 
But actually, the truth is, we activate the power of God through our prayers. I tell you, one of the biggest reasons why you may not be seeing something happening in your life that needs to happen is you may not be praying about it. And, and so I, I'm going to take, I want us to take just about 15 seconds right now before we go into our prayer needs. And I want you, first and foremost, we've worshiped God, but I want you to begin asking God for some specific things that you need. Come on, you know what they are already. You know what they are. I'm going to ask you, come on, right now, will you just pray with me right now? God, we thank you, Lord, that you are the worker of miracles. You're the one who heals. You're the one who delivers, God. You're the one who provides. You're the one who moves mountains. So God, on our behalf, we lift up our needs to you, God. We lift our prayers up to you. And we ask you to intervene in the middle of our situations in Jesus' name. 
God, I also want to pray for Hunter, Lord. I pray for his request that he needs prayer for his brother and his two friends who have gotten COVID. God, I pray for healing in Jesus' name and for strength. God, for Kevin, I, I pray, Lord, for you to give him discernment and courage and joy. Pray for Nicole for this upcoming job interview, for favor in Jesus' name. Pray for Jim for this peace for his school final. Pray for Isabella for direction regarding income in Jesus' name. For Levi, pray for peace and for joy. God, I pray for Michael, for his, his parents who both tested positive for COVID. I pray for healing and restoration. I pray for Joel's strength in his mind and his body. And God, we thank you, God, that you not only hear, but you answer in these requests. God, we come together and we pray and expect for miracles. And God, I also ask that you will show yourself to be mighty in this room at this time over these next few minutes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone says, everybody says, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. I think God's up to some good stuff today. Why don't you take a moment and have a seat in this room. And while you're having a seat, just want to share with you a couple of really cool things. Uh, this is normally the time where we all greet and hug each other, but unless you're immediate family, please don't. And uh, uh, because God does ask us to be wise. But hey, real quick here, whether you're watching online or here in this room with me, I want to encourage you in your giving right now. I want to thank you, first of all, for your consistency in your giving, because this is a, your, your giving has allowed so much to not only continue to happen, but, uh, but for, to, for, for us to be able to adapt into this current situation. So thank you so much. Uh, you know that, that uh, there are there are different ways to give. One of them, if you're here, you can give at the giving station located out there in the, uh, in the foyer. Also, you can from your computer go to the City Life FW website and, uh, and, and go there and, and you can give online there. You can give through the City Life app. But while you're preparing your gifts uh, and, uh, and doing all that, and I want to also thank all of you who have already given online or through recurring giving. Thank you. But uh, I just want to share this with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 tells us this, is that when we are generous toward God with our finances, when we are generous in our givings and in our offerings, it says, the scripture says that God will in turn enrich you. I like that word. He enriches you. Now, don't get that, don't make a mistake by saying he's going to make you rich because that's not what it says. But it says he will enrich you. I like that. You know what? Giving really does enrich us, enrich us and that comes from God himself. And, uh, and plus, the truth is, it goes on to say that your financial generosity, when you're giving to God's work, to God's church, it says that it, it results in thanksgiving to God because when you give, you're allowing a lot of things to happen through God's church, through the local church, and that brings honor to God. So part of your worship literally is giving. So I want to thank you as you're preparing your gifts. Also, just to let you know, tomorrow evening is our partnership track. If you would like to be a part of that online event, please go to the City Life app and mark partnership that you want to be a part of that. And, uh, and, and then we'll be in touch with you over the next 24 hours, giving you instructions, details on how to be a part of that. You can do it right from your home, and it'll be really simple and easy to participate in. Hey, another thing. This is good news here. Coming up two weeks from today, not next Sunday, but in two weeks, our service time for our live service is going to be changing till 9.30 a.m. So if, you're, if you like watching the live service, the live stream uh, at home, if that's the, the easiest way or best way for you, be sure to tune in at 9.30. Now, it'll continue to be on replay after that. But, uh, but we'll be gathering here for a 9.30 service coming up really, really soon. A lot of good reasons for that, more than I can explain up here, but, but I'm pretty excited about that shift and that change. Uh, also, uh, on that Sunday, on that Sunday, two weeks from today, and that is, let's see, Sunday the 12th, on that Sunday, we will be doing our first phase of the reopening of our children's ministry, which is going to be the, the baby infant nursery. So we will have, have staffed with volunteers there to, to help and to receive uh, babies during that time. So yeah, it's slowly, slowly coming around. And here's the big thing. I want you to mark this on your calendars. Get your phones out. Mark this, mark this on your calendars right now. This is important. But on Saturday morning, the uh, July, uh, Saturday morning, July 11th at 9 o'clock right here and online, 
we're going to be holding something called uh, Regroup. It's, it's, a, it's a regroup City Life training for City Life 2.0. And, and we're, as we're moving into a new season, we are regrouping as a church. And this is not a, a time, this is not a sermon, but it's a training time for all of us so that we can know how we can serve the work of God best uh, during this season. So I'm calling everyone who has City Life to be your home to be a part of that. Mark it on your calendars now. Now, more information will be coming. Uh, and there'll be some ticketing for it available on the City Life app as well as for the online uh, event. So a lot of good, good stuff coming up. You excited about it? Yeah, I am. I am. Well, why don't you take your Bibles, open your Bibles up uh, to a couple places today. I need you to find two places in your Bible. One is Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 10, 32. And the other is 2 Samuel 19, 5. Find both of those. We'll hit, we'll hit the Hebrews passage first and uh, mark that second package, package, package. It's not a package. What's it called? A passage. There it is. That second passage in 2 Samuel. Real good. You know, one of the things about, about preaching or any kind of public speaking is that occasionally you just, uh, you, you just say the wrong word. And, and I don't know how that ever happens. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it can come out really bad sometimes, and it has for me. But thank God none of that is recorded. But, but uh Right now, we're in a very unique season. You guys know that. But the word reset has been coming to my mind quite a bit, the word reset. And I thought, thought thinking about that, well, you know, what is a reset? Well, when you reset your phone or you reset your computer, it's more than just a reboot. It, it takes it back to, like, factory condition. It, it erases the memory, clears the machine, so it takes it to the place where you started off. If, you, uh, if you're playing a video game and you reset the video game, it forgets all the stuff that you've done and it starts you off fresh all over again. And, and, and today I want to talk about something I believe that God is doing in our lives and God's doing in our, in our church, God's doing all around us, and I call it a holy reset. In fact, that's the title of today's message, Holy Reset. I believe that God is resetting his people. Uh, he's jolting us out of our old normal. It, it, it's kind of like this divine tune-up that, that's going on around us. And the truth is, what was acceptable and was like okay a few months ago is no longer acceptable and it's no longer okay in so many different, different ways. I mean, whether it's your personal life or your family or your business or the community or your church family, things have shifted a lot. And so these are, scriptures tells us when we see these things happening, these are also signs that God is up to something bigger. I with all my heart, believe God is up to something huge. Now, a holy reset really starts off with, uh, with humility. It starts off with repentance. And, and, and I want to just put this out here. That doesn't necessarily mean repentance of sin or wrongdoing. If that applies to you, well, yes. But, but it could also involve repenting of letting the fire grow cold or letting life just kind of pass you by while you stand back and shrink back. It's like the circumstances are now in control of your life, and I think we need to repent of that. And during these times that are really uncomfortable, I, I, I'm asking you, will you please ask the Holy Spirit to fill you up with His Spirit? For real? <laughs> I'm not talking about just being Christians that are just going to like, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm a kind of Christian. I'm just going to barely get by. Because we're moving into a season where we need the fullness of his spirit like never before. Uh, guys, I, I'm going through a reset just like all of you are. And I've, been, I've tried to be very transparent about that up here week after week. And it's a good thing. But, but during your reset... It's important that you never see yourself as a victim of the current turmoil that's going on. You can't be a victim of it. Instead, the choice is during this season, you are going to be a victor over the turmoil. Now, as I was thinking about resets, I, I looked back into, into the scriptures, or really just, just to the kind of the, a broad knowledge of scriptures. What did resets look like 
in the Bible. Uh, during Bible times, I mean, what did they look like? What did, what did it mean? Because we, we, we go to the scriptures, and that gives us the foundation for what we can, uh, we can look at in the future. And, uh, and I think there's a lot that's there. I think there's, there's a lot that, that, uh, that we can begin to uncover and, and begin to examine. Because in the midst of this reset, we're still the church of Jesus Christ. We are still the body of Christ. Nothing changes. In fact, the church, the church of Jesus Christ has its best days ahead. And if you are really all about what we call around here making Jesus known, then here's my question. How does that play out in the culture? How does that play out in the middle of of turmoil and pain and confusion and frustration? And so, again, we go to the Bible. We go to the scriptures. Now, resets happened again many, many times in the scriptures and the stories of the scriptures. And, and here's one thing that always happened. Every single time, God's people, and that's important, God's people always came out better on the other end. Uh, the, through the resets of scripture, you know, there, there are three basic things that, all, that happened every time. There would be a, uh, like a re-consecration to the word of God. Like, I'm going to read it. I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to let it get in me. Uh, there also, every time in the scriptures, there was a reset that happened. There was this unique uh, fortitude. And, and, and in the New Testament, even a Holy Spirit empowerment to, uh, to, to move forward through challenges that are right in front of you. And another thing that happened during every one of these resets is there was always individual recommitment. People individually recommitted themselves to the, the fundamentals of their faith. Sometimes we get away from the fundamentals of our faith, but if you're gonna if you're gonna do it well, you gotta learn the fundamentals. If you're gonna play a sport well, you you've got to focus on the fundamentals, right? And that's what this is about. Hebrews chapter ten verse thirty two. I want us to look at this passage from the New International Version. And uh, before I read it, just want to give you a little bit of the setting. the The author here. We don't know who the author is, but but he, he he's writing to these people, and these would have been Jewish believers. Okay, but these people needed a holy reset. They 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 really did. They were once on fire for God, but they were starting to shrink back. Things didn't look all that good. So I want you to look in verse thirty two. He says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured a great conflict of suffering? He's reminding them of the way it was when things started off which even kind of reminds me of the ways things started off here with our church, with the City Life Church, and this was a dream. But I'm telling you guys, it was full of conflict and suffering. There was nothing simple or easy about it. But there was that dream and there was that vision, and we're going to move forward. And, and so he's reminding him, them of those old days. And he said, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those who were in prison and joyfully accepted the uh, confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. I mean, you read through that and you're thinking, okay, I thought I had it bad. These guys had it bad. I mean, my worst thing, my worst persecution I've had all week was when a Satanist got onto my Facebook and started posting stuff about, about the cult of Christianity. And you know what? The whole thing, I, it was so easy. I mean, I didn't even, of course, I'm not going to chit-chat with the, with the Satanist. So what I do is, I, is there's something really cool. It's called block. Do you guys know how to do that? So that was my persecution this week. Whoa, you know. And, and, and all of this, these people were going through all of this because of their witness for Jesus. Now, think about what they went through and how they were actually going through it with joy. But see, here's the deal. This was in their past. It's not happening anymore because they actually had given up the fight and they were, they were in need of a holy reset. And that's what the author of Hebrews is trying to say. Look, up, look he goes on to say this. He says, so do not throw away your confidence. That word confidence means uh, public outspokenness. It means uh, that that word in its original language means, uh, means this, this boldness that's associated with your faith in the message of Jesus. You're simply not going to be ashamed of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And what does he go on to say? He says, it will be richly rewarded, my friend. And then he goes on to say, 
hey guys, of course that's my part, <laughs> you need to persevere. I, I, I looked at that word persevere, and that word persevere means cheerful endurance. It means patient, continuous. You're just going to stick with it. Look at this though. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. There is this sweet reward for every believer who perseveres and who continues to move forward with confidence and doesn't throw their confidence away during the season. I'm telling you guys, you will receive what God has promised. And the thing is, guys, I am praying for this holy reset to, to really happen. And here's the deal. In the midst of the holy reset, I'm going to persevere. I'm challenging you to persevere with me. Even for my church, this dream of city life is for real. This isn't any joke, and it's not going away. The scripture goes on to say this. It says, for, and he, he makes some quotes here, for in just a little while, he who is coming will come <laughs> and will not delay. In other words, Jesus Christ is coming soon, guys. Got to keep that in mind. He's coming. And but my righteous one will live by faith. What does that word faith mean? That means believing and expecting the impossible, what you can't see, what you can't touch, what seems like it, it can't happen. You begin to act in faith. And that's what I'm calling the church to do. That's what I'm calling City Life Church to do. We're going to be a church of faith walking through this season. And then he goes back to say this, and this is interesting. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Speaking, that, those would be the words of God. God takes no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. I, I studied that word, you know, that, those words shrinks back. So that, that's actually the literal opposite of the term persevere. To shrink back basically means to withdraw or to cower or to get, get totally out of sight. In other words, drop off the grid. God takes no pleasure in that. But pastor, this is a hard word. No, this is God's word. I'm, I'm just telling you, church, no more messing around. No more messing around. Sure, it's hard, but, but it's now time to arise and let allow the holy reset to happen in your life, but also in your neighborhood and in your church and in your city and in your workplace because God does the greatest work in us when we're in trouble or when we're in transition. That's not even on the notes, but you, 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 you should write that one. God does his greatest work in us when we're in trouble or when we're in transition. And that's where we are. Thank God. God is doing a holy reset. So, so basically, I took this, this, this passage from Hebrews, and I, I, I come up with a definition for holy reset, for what this means. And, and here's my definition. Holy reset is, a, is confident, persevering faith. It is a holy refusal to shrink back. And I'm telling you, I choose the holy reset, and I want that in my life. I choose to be bold and outspoken, never afraid of the name of Jesus, and I challenge you to do the same. I challenge you to literally make Jesus known in your neighborhood. And I, I, guys, I will persevere. I will remain cheerful during difficult times. I'm asking you to join me in that. I'm going to patiently press forward in Jesus' name. And, and how am I going to do it? Not by what I see, because faith has nothing to do with what we see. I'm going to do it by faith and with faith, and I'm not going to shrink back. See, these people that this was written to, they were shrinking back. They, they were losing their confidence. I want to challenge you today. Do not throw away your confidence. Keep going. Don't give up during this season. Be outspoken about Jesus. That's what that word confidence means. Be outspoken about Jesus. What are you being outspoken about right now? You know, I don't know, because I'm not paying attention, trust me. What are you being outspoken about? Are you willing to do what the Bible says and be outspoken about Jesus? Make Jesus known in your home and in your community and, and, and in your neighborhood? Don't shrink back during this time. Persevere. Keep your faith surging because you are in the midst of a holy reboot. And I know these storms are real. Uh, there's economic and it's political turmoil and there's relational strain and there's sickness. I mean, I keep a chart on my, in my office on the board and I notice 
since this time last week, there's been a 32% increase in COVID cases in hospital beds in Tarrant County. And that's, that's, the, that's a huge jump from what I've, what I've seen in the past. But here's the deal. I'm not going to point fingers about this storm, and I'm not responsible for the storm. Oh, did you hear me there? Come on. I'm not going to point fingers about the storm, and I'm not responsible for the storm. But what I am responsible for is my response to the storm. You are responsible regarding your response to the storm. How are you responding? How am I responding? And what is that going to do for the kingdom of God? And I'm telling you guys, that's what the word says. Are, are, you, are you shaming other people in fear? Are you giving up? Are you striving? I'm telling you what, the storm is raging, so how are you responding? You know, you're not responsible for the storm. You're not responsible for the damage the storm causes either, but you're responsible for your response. Are you responding with faith? Are you pointing people to Jesus? Are you responding in love? Are you responding in joy? Are you responding in peace? Are you responding in faith? Those are my questions for you today. It's time for this holy reset to take place in our lives. And I'm challenging you to reclaim your confidence, reclaim that perseverance, reclaim that faith. It's time to let it happen. We're agents of Jesus, aren't we? Aren't we like charged with the task of making Jesus known in this world? And that means evangelism. It means discipleship. It means influencing culture in the name of Jesus. It means bringing justice to the oppressed and the marginalized and praying with faith. That's what that means. And if we engage with this holy reset, we're actually going to begin to start doing those things and not just talking about them or posting about them or acting like that. There, there's, there's, there's something that's out there right now, and it's like, if you put something on social media, that means you're okay. No, it doesn't. You hear me? No, it doesn't. Your actions always speak louder than words. Have you told anyone about what Jesus has done in your life? The people you're interacting with who are stressed out and freaked out, are you praying with them? Are you loving them? Are you calling people to prayer? What are you doing? Doing. What are you doing? And if you start doing these things that the scriptures tell us to do, which is what I'm, I'm going to do, things can begin to shift around you. What happens if you begin doing these things within your sphere? I mean, here's the deal. If the gospel is successfully presented in the context of your home, in your uh, neighborhood, or with your relationships, or with your job, or with your company, what would that look like for you? What would actually begin to shift and change in your sphere of influence? Huh? Well, I'm telling you the truth. If you're really doing this, it's not going to look the same. Since September of 2011... I prayed that this church would be a church that would be a part of a holy reset for our city and for downtown Fort Worth. And I thank God that God has allowed that to happen in the past. But the past is not just the past. We are, that's, what, that's what our roots are and that's what we will continue to be. I asked this question to myself and as I was preparing this message, what does a holy reset look like for downtown Fort Worth? And when I began praying about that, three things came to my mind. So I've got three little points here for you today, but they're big points, all right? You know, this, this first thing that I see that would be different in my city, different in, I call it my downtown. And I know I don't own downtown, and some people have mocked me for saying my downtown. But you know what? When you go to your neighborhood, do you not call it your neighborhood? Yeah. When you go to the apartment that you rent, do you call it your apartment? Yeah, okay, all right. I just call this my neighborhood, all right? I call it my downtown. Is that okay? Is it okay if City Life Church just calls us our downtown? All right, yeah, I think so. Since we're believers... And since believers wear something called the shoes of peace, and since Jesus, our Savior, is the Prince of Peace, and the Scriptures tell us to seek peace and pursue it, then I have this vision and this dream that if we really do this gospel thing of making Jesus known, downtown Fort Worth, my neighborhood, is going to be more peaceful because of us. I'm going to be confident with this. 
I'm going to persevere with faith through this. I'm praying for this. In this downtown, downtown Fort Worth, I don't know what you're praying for for your holy reset, but I'll tell you what I'm praying for. I'm praying for a holy reset of peace. Ethnically, relationally, and culturally. Under Jesus. I'm telling you guys, it needs to happen. And we are the one who carries this with us, the spirit of peace under Jesus. Psalm 29, verse 11 is a scripture you should have in your heart. It says this, it says, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. So wherever we go, we bring what? Peace. But you have to reclaim your confidence and reclaim your perseverance and your faith and not shrink back because the culture says you're not supposed to bring peace right now. And you've got to do it in the name of Jesus. There was this church in Ephesus. Paul had planted the church and uh, it was being pastored by young pastor by the name of Timothy. And uh, there were two different ethnic groups that attended the church, the Jews and the Gentiles, all right? Now, see, the Jews, they kind of prop themselves up as being the super Christians because they're in the line of Abraham. We are blessed. We are blessed. They would sing, you know, there's an old children's song we used to sing called Father Abraham, and they would sing Father Abraham, and they would mean it. And they would see the Gentiles try to sing, and it's like, uh-uh, he ain't your father. You're not as blessed as I am. I mean, it's, it's that kind of an attitude, all right? But these were two ethnic groups. Hey, can I pause for just a second? An ethnic group has nothing to do with the pigment of your skin. Pigments of skin is beautiful. Some of you are shocked I just said that. Can I say it again? An ethnic group has nothing to do with your pigment of skin because pigments of skin are beautiful. It's the rainbow that God created of his people. Sometimes it fits into that, but it's not always. See, these Jews and these Gentiles, they basically had the same kind of pigment of skin. But they were two very distinct ethnic racial groups. And Paul heard what was going on in that church, and he wrote them a letter. (laughs) He wrote them this letter, and he shattered the bigotry that was happening in the church. And if we can embrace this message, it works not only for this church, but for us as we're in the community. Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read this to you from the Passion Translation because it's passionate. I love this. But Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14, just jotted this in your notes, but it'll be on the screen. He, Paul says this, our reconciling peace is what? Jesus. I want to pause there for a second. Just pause right there. When our city asked me after I'd made an original proposal regarding how we can bring some healing to our community through regarding racial injustice. I submitted the original draft of the proposal. City manager said, I want you to go and I want you to find a a person. Find a person who's kind of on the outside a little bit and let's bring them in so they can kind of help lead this this charge. So I reached out to a friend of mine. He's an African-American black man from a was a former assistant city manager for the great city of Dallas, our neighbors that we always make fun of, but, but they're still are our neighbors, right? And I began talking with him. We had several phone calls. We had a lot of talking. And here's what he said to me. Never shared this publicly before because I don't throw this kind of stuff out there. I don't. There's no reason to throw it out there, but I think there is now. You want to hear what he told me? He said, Tim, I would love to be a part of this, but if Jesus is not at the center of what the, what the city of Fort Worth does, it will fail. He said, you can work and work and work, but if, 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 if there's not a spirit of reconciliation under the name of Jesus, it's going to fail. And I said, well, sir, what, what they're saying right now is that us as a group of pastors can lead this charge. We'll be able to point people to Jesus. He says, good, I'll, I would love to be a part of that. I would love to serve the city of Fort Worth in that way. Because I know I've been through all of this in Dallas, and 
he just said this. He says, everything you try to do in this city will be a band-aid, and something else will happen, and everyone will forget all that stuff that was done, and they will, they will scream and yell again. Just telling you what he told me, okay? This, that guy's from the big D. He would know. Well, we had our proposal. We put it together. We were ready to move forward with it. But the city council struck down the proposal the way that it was phrased as city council leaders here in our city said, we don't want pastors leading this. I pulled a couple of those city council members aside in the private meeting at City Hall, and I just said, if this isn't under the name of Jesus, do you know, you know this isn't going to work. And do you know what city council members actually said? It's like, yeah, but we don't know what else to do. This has got to look good to people. So we spent two years, two years. And, and I, what, what we actually created and brought forth was wonderful. I thought it was very, very good. But the truth is, the point of reconciliation under the name of Jesus never happened for our city. And until it does, there is no hope. Did you hear me? I've been down the road and have spent untold hours working with the government on these issues. Great progress has been made, and I'm proud of the work that, that the team has done. So other people have done a lot more than I did. I just came up with the original plan, you know. But the truth is that if Jesus is not at the center of it, all that stuff doesn't really take hold because the truth is it, ha it comes back to the hearts of individuals. And I know I'll be mocked for saying that. I know I have been mocked for saying that. Hearts have to change. Mock me all you want because I'm a Christian and I know this much. Until Jesus changes the heart, nothing can happen. Take a look at this. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14. Our reconciling peace is Satan, right? Did you hear me? If you, guys are, if you guys are agreeing with me, then you're wrong, all right? I just preached the word of God wrong, all right? Our reconciling peace is the government, right? Our reconciling peace is, is, a, is a march, right? No, and I'm not against government. I'm not against a march. I'm not against parades. I'm not against streamers. I'm not against banners. I'm not, you know, I don't like violence and destruction, but yay, you know, let's all do that. But what is our reconciling peace? Jesus. Look, he has made the Jew and the non-Jew one in Christ. By dying as our sacrifice, look at this, he has broken down every wall of prejudice that separated us. And he has now made us equal through our union with Christ. Ethnic hatred has been dissolved by the government. Did I say that right? No, ethnic hatred has been dissolved by the crucifixion of Jesus and his precious body on the Christ. That's why I will preach Christ. The legal code that stood condemning every one of us has now been repealed by his command. His triune essence has made peace between us. Oh, thank God, how beautiful, forming one new race. Some, some translations say one new man of humanity, Jews and non-Jews, fused together. The two have become one, and we now live restored to God and reconciled in the body of Christ. Through his crucifixion, hatred died. Oh, come on. If you can't get that excited about that, I mean, you know what? You, you just need to hear it again. Because through his crucifixion, hatred died. For the Messiah has come to preach this sweet message of peace to you, the ones who were distant and to the ones who are near. And now because we are united to Christ, we both have equal and direct access in the realm of the Holy Spirit to come before the Father. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 through 18. Read it, study it, dice it, splice it on your own. This is what a holy reset can look like in a community when we release Jesus into our community. And I say this to you, my church and my family. I say it to me. I say it to my own family. Reclaim your confidence. Reclaim your perseverance and your faith. Do not shrink back because Jesus is our reconciling peace. Everything else is a band-aid. Trust me, I would know. 
And it starts right here with my church, with this City Life Church family, united in Christ Jesus. We are going to take this message of peace and unity to the streets because that's just who we are. God does his greatest work in us when we're in trouble or when we're in transition. And that's my first point. My second point of what a holy reset looks like is this. It's a holy reset of power. A holy reset of power. And that's what I want to see happening in this church. I see this church with a holy reset of power. It's where God's power dwells in us richly. The gifts of the Spirit are are flowing in our lives. And we are not weak, barely saved Christians. That's where we believe and we practice it and we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we have faith. We have that word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, gifts of healings, workings of miracles and prophecy and discerning of spirits and tongues and interpretation of tongues. Everything that you find in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. That's what I believe God wants to do in our midst. You see, the reason for that is so that we can minister to each other with power during difficult times. That's what I want. And then we not only minister to each other, but we take this message to the streets. We live it out there. We take the power of God onto our cultural streets. Reclaim your confidence, church. Reclaim your perseverance. Reclaim your faith. Do not shrink back. Every single holy reset in the scriptures, I mean, it resulted in greater confidence. It resulted in more perseverance. It resulted in more faith. God, let it be in us. God's power working through his people is what made the difference. It's a holy reset of peace and power, and here's the third one. It's a holy reset of possessing your future. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to begin to possess your future. It seems like everything's been put on pause in a sense. And, and some of you, you're looking at this saying, well, like the future that I felt God had spoken to me, it must be derailed because, I don't, because of what everything's happening around me. Well, I want to challenge you to possess the gates of your future. Possess your future. You're in control of what comes in and what goes out. Now, I'm, let me explain to you what that means. I asked you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 5, and we're going to look at that and read through this passage here real quick. In this passage, we see King David. Uh, King David, he is, with his, uh, he, he is in the process of leading and governing. He has a son by the name of Absalom, and his son would go out into the city gate. Now, here, understand this. Whoever had the most authority in the city gate got to choose what came in and what went out. They could drive out what needed to be driven out, and they would allow in whatever they would allow in. Well, the king's son was sitting there doing that, so he was pretty much in charge of what came and went to Jerusalem, and that's where the the leaders of the city would, would come and do business. And so he was there... He was there interacting with the leaders of the city and doing all this stuff. And, and uh, at a certain point, people started saying, well, Absalom, you're, you know, you got it going for you. I mean, you're the king's son. You're good looking. You're handsome. Why don't you just, why don't you be king? A whole lot better than David. And uh, the truth is, Absalom decided he was going to do that. He led a revolt against David, literally drove David out of town and tried to be the king. Da- Absalom tried to be the king. Uh, but David and his, his army, under the direction of his, his general, Joab, they, they went after Absalom and, and all of the rebels. And, and Absalom ended up getting hung by a tree because of his hair. And he, you know, that's a cool story. Well, it's kind of a cool story. You go to the Bible, you'll, you'll, you'll read it. If you've never read it before, believe me, my boys loved it when I read them that story. And they would say, Daddy, I never want to be an Absalom. I said, that's good, son. But, uh, but, but, but he was killed as he, as he hung from the tree. Um, after this, they came back and told David and David was broken. He was heartbroken. He would just sob and weep. And the armies came back to, to Jerusalem like, we've been victorious over this, this attempt to destroy the kingdom. And we've been victorious over this. But, but David wouldn't even come out and greet the, greet the soldiers. David wouldn't even celebrate the moment because he was grieving the loss of his son, who is the leader of the rebels. Okay, but I want you to look now at 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 5. It says, then Joab, this is, this is the general, okay? He went into the house to the king, and he said, Today 
you have humiliated all your men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. I don't know what he was doing with wives and concubines. That was actually a violation of God's word. We'll talk about that in another story, okay? But you love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. And I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left with you by nightfall. <laughs> I like that because that was kind of like the voice of the Holy Spirit. Joab just came in here and he just, he talked to the king with a lot of fortitude, I guess you'd call it. He said, this will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come on you from your youth until now. Just pause for a second. David was in the middle of a storm there. You, you, you catch it. Just about lost the kingdom and he lost his son. He was in the middle of a storm. You can't control the storm, but you can, you can control your response. Well, your response is what you are responsible for. Look at that next verse. It says, so the king got up and took his seat in the gateway. And when the men were told the king is sitting in the gateway, they all came before him. See, at that point, then David began to take authority over his city again. He stepped up into his rightful place, and he decided, what I'm, here's what I'm going to allow in, and here's what I'm, I'm going to push out. And that's my cry for you today. Joab told David, get back in the gate. That's the place of your influence. Where's your influence? Where is your cultural street? What has God gifted you and anointed you to do? And if you've not been thinking about that or even doing anything with that over the past several weeks, why have you ignored that just due to the storm? You can't control the storm. You can't control the damage the storm has done. But you can control your response to the storm. And we must control our response to the storm. You are responsible for that before God. And remember this, God will always do his greatest work in you when there's trouble or transition going on. So here's what I challenge you to do. Possess your future. I possess the gates of your future just like David did. You are in control of what comes in and what you need to push out. Reclaim that confidence over your life, whether it has to do with your family or your business or your, or your, your, your witness. Move forward with your perseverance and your faith. Do not shrink back. This is not the time for that. Times are tough. Yeah, I know. Times are confusing. Yes, I know. Some of you are losing friends because of all kinds of things going on. But here's the deal. You're a child of God. You're a son of the king. His spirit is in you. So will you let the Holy Spirit to empower you to get moving again? Because you're anointed. You're blessed. You have talents. You have skills. You have insight. You have wisdom. And I believe some of the best ideas for the future are right here even in this room. And you, are, you can be released into that if you're willing to take the step forward. In fact, even this Saturday, July 9th, I, I, I wasn't even, July 11th, I wasn't even really thinking about it when I prepared this message, but we're having this, this kind of like City Life 2.0 training. It's like, man, you know, how timely that we're going to be doing that. Because here's the truth. You can be a part of it. I'd love for you to be a part of it. This church is going to search forward because we're in the middle of a holy reset. It's a holy reset of peace and of power and possessing. And I'm asking you to join me in. Are you, but are you gonna let it happen to you personally? Reclaim your confidence. Reclaim that perseverance. Reclaim your faith and don't shrink back because God has something amazing for you and only you know it. God has something amazing for this church and God is revealing it. God has something amazing for you. This is not the end. This is the beginning of something wonderful if you'll let the holy, that, 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 that holy reset, if you'll let it happen in your life. Because I'm letting it happen in our church. If you're here this morning, whether you're watching online or in this room, and you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you to make the decision to follow Jesus. 
Because without Jesus, none of this is possible. Let a holy reset happen in your life by inviting him in. And if that's you, I want you to pray these words with me. In fact, in this room, will you just say these words also, just as encouragement to anyone around us who may be praying this. Pray, dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I turn from my past, and I embrace the future that you have for me. Let the holy reset happen in my life today. I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer with me, I'd love it if you would just go online and send through a prayer request or go to the next form and use the app to do that or go online to do that and just let us know that you just gave your life to Christ. I want to be back in touch with you with some resources and some tools regarding moving your life forward. But as we move forward here into these next few minutes in this room and as you're watching online, I'm going to step up the platform because I've talked to you for a while. I've preached to you. I've preached my heart out. But God can do a whole lot more than I could ever do. Will you be willing to just pause in his presence and worship him and let his Holy Spirit speak to you, minister to you, and just and, and allow just just even invite that that holy reset, invite it into your life. I've invited it into the church, and so I'm asking you: Will you invite it into your life? Because you're not at the end. All things may look crazy. You don't know what to do about the storm, but you can respond appropriately. It's time to move forward in your walk with God and in making Jesus known. During this time, let's just pray. Let's just worship God. Take these next few minutes and let God do something. God bless you.
God, look you full in the face and make you prosper. Have a wonderful week. I can't wait to be back in church next week. God bless.